The history of woodland in Kempley begins with the taming of the ancient woodland, which developed on the retreat of the last ice age, 10,000 years ago. According to the Doomsday Book, in the late 11th century, the Dimmock estate included a wood measuring three leagues by one league, about four square miles. There's also evidence that the southwestern part of Dimmock Parish once belonged to a great wood called Ted's or Tettles Wood that extended across the county boundary. In the mid-12th century, the Lord of Dimmock gave half of his woodlands to the Cistercian monks of Flaxley Abbey. These included three on the parish borders of Kempley, Hend Park, Allams and Cockshoot. The monks cleared parts, and a further eight men, including two smiths, a forester and a charcoal burner, had cleared forest areas known as Assarts here. The woodland retained by the manor was wasted during the wars immediately following the accession of Henry III in 1216, but this quickly regenerated. By 1335, the woodland is described as common pasture. Dimmock Wood, which was enclosed in the early 16th century, was already long managed as coppice and supported significant charcoal burning activity. In Haywood in the late 1630s, a woodward was employed to preserve the woods from depredation by local cottagers and their animals. He cut and turned large quantities of coppice into charcoal, providing fuel to the ironmaster John Foley at Oxenhall. The woods were managed on a perpetual sustainable rotation cycle of 14 years growth. Some of the smaller groves attached to tenant farms were also used, and leases granted by the manor usually reserved all timber on the farms, except that allowed to tenants to be used for the upkeep of buildings and hedgerows. The large quantities of oak bark produced by such operations were sold in the 1630s to Gloucester City leather tanners, and by the early 18th century the area was supplying bark for tanneries in Newent and elsewhere, as well as wood for making hoops for barrels, laths for building and broomsticks. Throughout history the nation's oak forest has supplied wood to build English warships, and in 1802 Lord Nelson, anticipating the future requirement to the dockyards of the Royal Navy, ordered that thousands of acorns be planted in the Forest of Dean, including the Dimmock Forest. It took the timber from 6,000 trees to build just one first-rate ship of the line like his flagship HMS Victory. What Nelson didn't anticipate was that by the 20th century ships would be built of steel, not wood. Nevertheless, Dean Oak was used to help repair HMS Victory in time for the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar in 2005. In 1901, the parish's woodlands gave employment to three woodmen and woodcutters, a gamekeeper who lived next to Hendwood, and a timber merchant with employees at Brooms Green. The Dimmock Forest woods were acquired by the Crown in 1914, and from 1924 administered by the newly formed Forestry Commission. After the First World War, forestry planting provided employment and strategic replenishment of fuel and timber resources. Charcoal burning ended in the 1920s, but the supply of oak bark to the tanning industry continued until the mid-20th century. 1948 saw the introduction of a national policy of widespread conifer planting, the objective being to create a reserve of timber in the event of a major national emergency, like the war the country was still recovering from. Although much of the Forest of Dean was underplanted with larch and fir, many areas locally were still maintained in a traditional woodland manner, evidenced by the tall oaks, the hazel dappled shade, promoting the carpets of nationally rare wild daffodils that still attract springtime visitors today. John Anderson is a retired Dimmock Beat forester and lives in what was the original Crown Lodge in Queen's Wood. He came to Gloucestershire in 1962 and at that time the Forestry Commission's work locally involved four foresters, around a dozen labourers, one lorry and a horse. These dozen local men weren't schooled or trained in forestry. Looking after the woodland encircling their homes was in their blood, passed down over generations from father to son. Forestry practice was expressed in the local vernacular, with techniques and tools specific to the Dimmock Forest. Areas had evocative local names, not registered on any map, like Piccadilly and Misery Patch. A working day back then would involve loading the lorry in the morning with wood for pit props to shore up the coal mines in South Wales. When the lorry returned in the afternoon it would be loaded up with larch poles for lap fencing. All the loading was done by hand without the aid of mechanical hoists. Forestry work had long been hard graft for little reward, as John Anderson recalls. The wages were extremely low and this piecework system was worked to try and enhance, get more out of the blokes and for them to get 
bit better wages and they were expected to earn sort of 25-30% more than their weekly wage on piecework. Well at one time there was no wet time paid and then it became, there was agreement, a minimum of two hours rain and you got paid. It was an hour and a half rain, you didn't get paid. And so, yeah, workers tended to work all through the weather. When he was training in the mid-1950s, John had learned to use a hand axe, but the early 1960s saw a change that challenged the piecework system of performance-related pay. By the time I got to Dimmock, the workers, although they were employed by the Forest Commission, were starting to buy their own chainsaws, and that caused major problems with piecework because the rate was set for hand tools, they had the initiative to go and buy their own chainsaws and their productivity rocketed up. Then slowly, forest management began to take a different direction, with a gradual shift from working the woodland to leisure and conservation. From the 1970s, there was this pressure from the public on landscape, uh, destruction of ancient forest, People were getting cars and getting into the countryside, so they wanted recreation, they didn't know where to go, there was no guidance, so things were starting to change. John's role went on to create cycle trails, the sculpture trail and camping facilities, all within the public forest estate. Preservation of species and habitat became a role for the forest conservation ranger. Broadleaved woodland can take up to a century to grow to full maturity, so after a thousand years under management, what does John think the future holds for the Dimmock Forest? People love wood and it's used more and more in building. I, I, all right, things do change and they've always changed in the past. But I think it's assured we're going to need timber right into the future. The type of timber might well change. I think this fuel business, you could start changing dramatically. We might well go back to coppice with big harvesters, chipping coppice every... 15 years as they did before. And also people's expectations are different now, I feel. Um, tourism, for example. Your forests have got to look good for people to be attracted there. And so landscape is very important. It might be Dimmock Forest in 50 years. It wouldn't surprise me at all if there's no conifers here at all. It'll be judged that this little forest is so important it's past history, it's good broad leaves that, that can grow. But why are we bothering with bits of conifer here and there? There'd be more benefit from going back to a completely broadleaf forest. That, that could well happen, that, that could be a, something that um, these old forests go back to what they were.